Welcome to part three of our four part series for peer leaders focusing on coaching skills to promote mental health resilience and well being. My name is Dr. Drea Letamendi and I'm a clinical psychologist with Residential Life and the RISE Center. Today, my colleague Marika Turner and I will be talking about skills that will support you as a peer leader in navigating virtual spaces as a part of your work. This includes focusing on the skill known as active listening. The first thing I want to do is just address the challenges that a lot of us might be experiencing when we're attempting to connect with other students. This virtual space or platforms like this one that you're looking at um, might create some challenges for us. There may be parts of their experience that are causing them discomfort or stress that are kind of outside of that picture. Are they experiencing some distress related to family conflict related to other members of their household? Is there something about their situation, either if they're on campus or at home off campus and some kind of off campus um, housing situation that might lead to some, um, some environmental family or relational issues that you may not be aware of. So I think just understanding the full picture can be challenging at this time. Marika, I'm wondering if you've experienced any of these challenges when you've been, when you've been using some of these virtual platforms with students. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges um, that I've experienced with students is this like really lack of this flow within a conversation um, due to just technical glitches. Like you may say something and then you have to repeat yourself or maybe you're both saying something at the same time and there's these weird pauses or stops sort of mess with the vibe of the conversation um, that can kind of deteriorate the conversation. Thanks, Marika. I totally agree. I think that often, um, as effortful as we might be, there are some technical glitches sometimes. And, um, you know, when, when you're used to talking with someone in person, again, you might be able to see the whole picture and you might be able to read some of the cues that are important to you as, as a peer counselor. The other thing, too, is that um, as we're experiencing Zoom and, and virtual platforms can be really distracting. We're looking at a number of, of different things on our screens and, um, you know, just making that human to human connection can be a lot more challenging and just feel very weird. I have four ideas that I want to present to folks as possible suggestions for how to overcome these barriers when using a virtual space. The first one is to help ground the student that you're working with. The second is to think about engagement. The third is how to work with a student who might not have a private space to talk. And then fourth, how do you, how do you create a sense of privacy? You know, so first, there may be a situation where uh, a student is either um, in a, a household or in a situation where there might be a lot of distractions or noise around them. And this is often true for students who might be uh, undergoing remote instruction and they might be sharing a lot of their technology and their resources with others in the household. So a couple ways to ground uh, a student in the situation and when I say grounding I mean taking a moment to allow the student to just recognize and build awareness of the self in their space um, include a, a couple of really quick techniques. The first one I like to do is to acknowledge the senses and this can be kind of um, a process where you start with um, vision and then hearing and um, smell, taste, feeling to the ability, you know, match these questions to the ability and, um, and the identity of the student that, that you're working with. So as you address the senses, you give them a moment to, to just appeal to what their experience is surrounding those, um, those senses. It also allows them to just gain a sense of um, a, a sense of awareness of their environment and also just how they're feeling in that environment. Another way to address being in a stressful or noisy household or, or situation is to acknowledge what they have control over and what they don't have control over. So for instance, um, they may have control over um, uh, some background noise, maybe they can shut a window, maybe they can turn other technology off, maybe they can have a conversation with other household members that might not be aware that they're trying to have a private conversation. And then also, you know, help them understand and acknowledge the things that they may not have control over in order for them to make those adjustments and, you know, again, just build a sense of presence during the moment. I also mentioned engagement. Engagement is a core part of your work, right? So um, one thing that I like to do is just kind of 
and acknowledge what their surrounding is. Um, this is kind of, sh of a show and tell with their, um, with their, what's in their room. So if I notice like a Wonder Woman poster or a book or a plant, you know, asking questions about like, tell me about, tell me about that movie or tell me about that plant. Does your plant have a name? Um, that will give you some sense of their interest, but also, I mean, we've got to kind of create this virtual connection to, to where, where they're at. Another thing you can do to build engagement or to sustain focus too, right, is to um, take a moment sometimes to um, limit senses. And one example of this is to um, have a brief meditation, close your eyes, and just kind of acknowledge, um, do some breathing. And that helps a student to just, again, have a moment to be present with you and connect directly with you. Another example here too is acknowledging that a break might be needed. So maybe you agree upon a five minute snack break or a five minute movement break where both of you um, uh, get up or get um, off screen and get something to eat or drink, um, move your body, do some stretching, or even take a walk. Lastly here, I'll say there are fun things we can do with our um, virtual backgrounds and there's lots of different opportunities to um, really personalize your image or your background and that's something that can also kind of build connection and engagement keeping in mind that there might be some students who maybe don't want to show their um, environment through video and, and that they may choose a virtual background most of the time i noticed um, too that it's important here to talk about um, privacy right as well as safety so um, you know i mentioned having uh, earphones or having um, having the ability, having headphones, the ability to have some privacy, offer too some other examples of connection. So this could include a phone call. It could include texting or chatting. It, it could also include like, hey, is today not a good day? Maybe we need to reschedule for another time. And acknowledge with them too, what, what time of the day in their new rituals and their new schedules makes sense for them to have this connecting experience. Gauge to where their location is, and it also may mean, as a good practice, have their phone number so that if you get disconnected over Zoom or you don't have the ability to, um, to respond quickly over a virtual platform, if there's something urgent, you'll have their phone number. And that's a really good segue into safety. How do you create safety and privacy? I know students are um, creative and also finding um, it necessary to maybe remove themselves from their um, usual spaces or some busy household spaces in order to find privacy and time with you. And that's something that I think should be talked about among you in order to, um, to kind of problem solve what this can look like if they've never really done this before. Thank you so much, Drea, for all of those amazing tips. So again, I want to introduce myself formally. My name is Marika Turner. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the health and well-being coordinator for residential life. And I want to just talk a little bit about active listening. So first, I want to recognize that active listening is a practice that develops over time. And you can develop the skill by listening with your full presence and conversations throughout the day. And notice how the interaction shifts when you are actively listening. And then also pay attention to habits that prevent active listening. So there are six key components as it relates to this practice which is clarifying, encouraging, reflecting, validating, restating, and summarizing. So clarifying is making sure you understand what has been stated and then re repeating key points of what the person has said and using their specific words. Encouraging is asking something like what happened next or asking how you can support them further once they've finished um, talking. And then reflecting could be stating, based on what you shared, it sounds like you're pretty. And then you input whatever feeling word that you think they're feeling. And then you clarify to see if that's actually how they're feeling. So it could be something like, based on what you shared, it sounds like you're pretty frustrated. And then asking if that's how they actually feel. Restating is saying, in other words, you are saying that. And then input whatever needs to be after that. And then summarizing is saying something like, from what you shared, it sounds like these are the key points, and then restating those main points. So those are six key components that you can use all of them when active listening or just certain components to really be fully engaged in the conversation you're having with students. And then when developing your skill of active listening, 
there are a couple of things you should avoid. The first thing to avoid is interrupting. Stopping someone's story can make them feel unheard and dismissed. Allow the speaker to share comfortably using effective questions in silence. Another is offering advice. It can be difficult to see someone in emotional distress. This desire to fix the situation can lead one to offer advice instead of simply just listening. A third thing to avoid is giving suggestions. When someone is sharing their story, they mostly need to be heard and witnessed. And lastly, avoid talking about your own experiences unless you're specifically asked to. Practice cultural humility when listening to a student. Talking about your own experience takes away focus from the student and makes the dialogue about you. The student may lose trust and feel unsupported. Those are some key components and also some things to avoid when it comes to active listening. And Drea and I are now going to do a little role play scenario just so you can see what, what active listening looks like um, in practice. Thanks, Marika. Here's the scenario. My family really needs me right now. My dad left the country a few months to take care of things back home and left me in charge of my mom, sister, and the store. With COVID, everything has been overwhelming. And even though we're considered essential workers, there's been a lot of stress on the family. I need to be at the store a lot more during the week and man, it's just too much to stay on top of my classes. Here is a potential response to what the student is expressing. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. Your father's absence right now has left you to be in charge of not only the rest of the family, but the store. Because you have to devote more time to the store and be focused on your classes, you're left feeling overwhelmed. Am I correct in saying you feel overwhelmed? Yeah, I would say that that's um, exactly how I'm feeling. Yeah, and it's understandable to feel this way, given the family dynamic has changed and it can be challenging to balance home life and your school life. And I just want to know, how can I continue to support you during this time? Thanks, Marika. That last question was so helpful for me to hear because it showed empathy and it included an open-ended question that, um, that really made me think about what, uh, what I might do next. And I really appreciate that this builds upon some of the other skills that, that we're learning in, in the previous sessions, right? How to build empathy, how to ask questions effectively, how to communicate. And, and this is um, a nice way to kind of um, comprehensively integrate all of those skills. Uh, it also, I know this was a role play, but it felt, it felt really um, supportive to hear someone say like, what, what can I do to help you in this situation? Active listening isn't necessarily scripted in this way. I think the biggest piece to take away from active listening is to really be present with the student and to really try to understand where they're coming from and you know, a student just wants to be heard. And as long as you're coming from that piece, I think you're gonna do a really great job with this. Thank you, Marika. So this wraps this counseling skill and I urge folks to check out the fourth skill, which uh, includes discussions on how to keep students motivated during tough times.